guys, welcome back to a really long break for my videos. Um, I owe you guys a new video for my Halo implementation setup, so this is what this is going to try to be. The next one we're going to be talking about will be contracts, contract types, billing plan combinations, and so on. Some of this content already exists on my YouTube channel already. There have been significant changes since the last time that I've done it, so hopefully some of this stuff will be fresh to you. Uh, if not, well then, um, hopefully your reviewer is good. <laughs> Um, we'll go from there. I do have a blanket as my backdrop because um, in, I'm in Orlando right now and it's very sunny outside and I do not want to look like I'm coming out of a halo or something like that, that I have a halo or whatever. It was just very distracting. Um, with that being said, let me go ahead and we are going to share my screen. And this is our training Halo. Hasn't really been touched since then. I'm a bit, uh, I don't know, happy because I'm doing another video. And let's drive, dive right into the today's discussion topics. Um, so contracts are in the contracts area. In some cases, they may be called agreements, depending on your language pack in Halo. Uh, they're pretty straightforward for the most part until you start diving into them. You can see that you've got like the reference number, the labor type, the client site, Etc. That are that are all available here. Um, what we want to do is we're not going to be covering every aspect of contracts. Contracts has a lot inside of it, and some of it are things that are not necessary for the average MSP. Some of them are things that um, are related to a legacy style of billing, and so on. Um, we want to use the contracts specifically for one thing. I get I get this question all the time. What is the point of having a contract? Um, we want to bucket the time that you would normally charge for. So Halo has four types of billing methods. They've got the ability to say, uh, don't invoice it at all, essentially write that time off as it's not uh, not been consumed or profitable or anything like that. It's, it's lost time, essentially lost uh, revenue or expense, essentially. Um, you have the ability to say that the time is uh, accountable to a client, but it's covered by an agreement. And we'll go back and talk about that in a little bit more. And then finally, you have the time, you have the ability to say that it is, again, accountable to a client, but it's covered by prepay hours or a prepay dollar amount. And then finally, you can say uh, that um, it is accountable to a client and it's uh, billable as an invoice. So you can either invoice the time you can apply a contract to that time, which won't invoice it because it's uh, because it's under a contract, or you can apply it to prepay, which again will not invoice it, uh, generally speaking, or you can just say um, don't invoice it at all, and it's lost time essentially at that point. It's written off. Um, so those are the four billing methods to use. Um, I prefer. There are some people that say like you don't need a contract. Um, under you know for the different types of time that you have depending on the complexity of the msp and how you're doing it i prefer to have a contract um in almost all cases let me just lower my main master volume down a little bit sorry uh i do prefer to have a contract in place if the time is being covered by an actual contract and we'll talk about some of the ways that can happen um in a moment so when you're building a contract there are a couple things that we need to be aware of. Let's go ahead and create the new button. We need to choose a client. Um, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and choose, uh, you know, Mendy Online. We need a contract reference. This reference number, you can absolutely just hit the generate button and let it generate a button uh, number for you. The problem is that the contract reference number, number one, has to be unique. And number two, there are situations in Halo where all you will see is that reference number. And it's possible that you will not be able to identify the client or the type of contract or which contract that is just by generic MEN001. What I prefer to do is specify the name of the client, hyphen, and then type of contract or some sort of identifier that lets you know what is that contract specifically. We can say, you know, or and so on and so forth, right? So I'm just going to say manage services right now. Um, 
and we're going to move on. So now when I see this, I'll know like this is the managed services contract at Mendy Online. I could have a VoIP contract. I could have some other contracts. This is what tells me what it is. And it will be unique because it's pairing the client name and the type of contract. And hopefully you don't have more than one of the same type of contract per client. If you do, we have to have a conversation. Um, the labor type. Uh, there are two types of labor types that we can do for the contract. It's just basically saying, is it a fixed labor, which basically means that every month it starts over again, or is it a prepay, which basically accumulates the labor and the prepaid time that allows you to then use it over a period of whatever, however long you want, as opposed to fixed, is saying you get X number of hours every Y period. Okay, so 99.9% .9 of your managed services contracts specifically will be fixed. Um, if we type this, set this to be labor, uh, labor type is fixed, we're going to go ahead and set a start date. The start date matters only because if we're going to be putting time in, we need to make sure the time is put in on a date after the start date of the contract. If we want the contract or the agreement to cover that time, the time stamp of that time has to be after the start date of the agreement, otherwise it will not work. Most managed services, if you're supposed to be talking about like all you can eat and so on and so forth, most modern managed services contracts today uh, are going to be on auto renew at some point. Either it's month to month or it's annual or it's three year. It doesn't make a difference. There will likely be an auto renewal period uh, of some kind. And that auto renewal, um, uh, that, yeah, it'll have an auto renewal period of some kind. Let's not, I'm confusing myself here. So what we want to do is that next call date is going to be where we set the renewal period. So if we're starting in May 1st, 2024, we want this to be May 2025. Sorry, April 30th, 2025. Right? And so um, this way. Oh, excuse me. Woke up early. All right, um, this way what will happen is uh, the contract is going to be set to no end. If I change the end date type here, I'm going to set this to no end. I'm not going to have an end date. Contracts with an auto renewal don't end. They just keep going. There's a renewal period, but they're not ending. Um, if the contract really does end without a renewal period, uh, does without an auto renewal, then by all means, go ahead and set your end date. But if it is on auto renew, you don't want to be managing that contract end date every single time. It's just going to be really annoying. So we set this to no end date and we set the next call date to tell us, hey, this is when the renewal is up. The labor period in almost all cases, when it comes to all you can eat, uh, fixed labor for managed services, it will be monthly in, again, in almost all cases. There are certain types of contracts where you'll do like a block hours. Um, and so you'll say you get 10 hours a month. And then again, that labor period is monthly, but there are situations where you can sell, you know, hundred hours a year or you know, 150 hours every six months, or depending on the size of the client and what they're looking for, the different variations are available. But for the most part, the labor period is monthly in almost all cases. Um, again, with all you can eat, we're putting in the unlimited hours here. Now these hours can be zero, which means that since the contract isn't covering any time, we are gonna charge for it. The contract hours per period can be 50, which means that 50, remember I said X for Y period, the X is the hours per period, and the Y is the labor period of monthly. We can say it's 50 hours a month, 50 hours a year, 50 hours a week, uh, depending on the size of the customer and what you're able to get away selling them uh, to make sure that their systems are covered. Again, the modern managed services is almost always all you can eat. What that usually means, there's a lot of different definitions for it. A lot of different people do different things. And at some point, maybe Rising Tide will get into a practice of standardizing what managed services actually do. But for the most part, all you can eat generally means that you get unlimited hours. Um, and then there are other things that you can throw in with it uh, at some point. But all you can eat usually, from the beginning, the original definition of it usually referred to the number of hours under the contract. So it's all the hours you can have. It's like an all you can eat buffet. Uh, uh, however much you want to use us, you get to use us. It does not include anything else other than hours at its core definition. So hours per period, we're going to do this unlimited because it is all you can eat contract. Um, and the contract type uh, here in the agreement subtype here, notice the different naming conventions. This is another one of your Haloisms uh, that it's just 
consistency is not always there. Again, it's just a language pack correction. We can fix that if we want to. Uh, but in this case, we've got the contract type, which sets the gold, silver, bronze, or managed service. We can talk about those in a minute. And then we have the agreement subtype. It's important to know that the agreement subtype is not linked to the type itself. Um, and so in reality, it's not quite a subtype. It's type one and type two. It's two different, it's like category one, category two. It's two different categories for the contract. It's not really a type subtype. Um, so it's a shift in mindset when you think about that for a moment. And we'll talk about the different ways that we can use type uh, in a little bit so that you know how we can effectively uh, build out your, your contracts. The most, the most obvious one to call out is like if you have a contract of gold and a contract of silver and you want to display profitability of contracts by type to tell you like where you should be spending most of your effort building, um, having that type built out will allow you to basically build a report showing profitability grouped by type. Um, and so that way you can, you can see, oh, the golds are generally more profitable than the silvers, or the silvers are more profitable than the golds. We really don't want those golds. Um, what, what is it? Let me, let me sidetrack for a second. I know this is supposed to be a Halo conversation, but honestly, most of my consulting calls with Halo end up, uh, with clients talking about Halo, end up being about general MSP stuff anyways. Um, let's talk for a second about the different types of contracts that are listed here. Uh, very old school, um, pretty classic. We have gold, silver, bronze. Um, some people like using platinum gold um, and then silver or something like that. You know, there's different levels that you would offer. And go, again, going back to the classic days, we would have uh, the highest level would include unlimited hours for remote and on-site support. And then the middle level would include unlimited hours for remote support only, but we would bill for on-site. And then finally, the lowest tier could either be not an unlimited hours, or it could be, you know, RMM patching and maintenance only, um, or things like that. Uh, so based off of what we're discussing right now, like what, why would we, like, obviously the gold package is the most premier type. It's the more expensive type. Why would that not be more profitable? And the answer is, well, um, if you're spending more time going on site that you're not charging for, then you're not making as much money. Uh, there's, there's a, a balance in the finance world that we're talking about when in the business world, when we're talking about finances in terms of how much money you're spending how much money you're bringing in. And the spending of money covers not just actual dollar amounts, but it also covers expenses for pay, for payroll, uh, how much time you're investing with the client, and so on and so forth. One of the things that people tend to forget is that as a managed services provider, um, when you're dealing with contract customers specifically that have all you can eat, the less time you spend on them, the more profitable they are. That does not mean they're healthier. It just means that they're more profitable for you because your effective hourly rate is super high. If you charge $1,000 a month and all you work on for that client is one hour a month, you're getting paid $1,000 an hour. If you spend two hours a month on them, you're getting paid $500 an hour. And so the profitability of the client number one is more than the profitability of the client number two. It does not mean that they're healthy. It does mean that it's more profitable. And so if you have uh, another contract where you're spending two hours a month on that client and they're paying a thousand dollars a month, but one of those hours is billable because it's on site and they only have remote only, then they're more profitable than even the first client who is only, you're only spending one hour on because the second hour you're being paid for. And so it's a thousand dollars an hour for the first hour. And then whatever your hourly rate is for the second hour at that point. Um, so again, it's just a matter of ba that balancing. Uh, when it comes down to the finances that we have to keep in mind. Um, not all work is good work. Not all clients are healthy clients. Not all profitable clients are healthy clients. Um, part of the client relationship is that relationship. And so if the client feels like they're paying you too much money, they're just going to go look somewhere else to look for. They have to be able to feel the value that you're giving them and make it make your services, the cost of your services, worth it to them. Um, so again, quick tangent. We're going to get back to the contract types here. But that's, this is one of the reasons why potentially you'd want to be able to break this down by type. So you can say like this type of contracts are more profitable or less profitable and why and start digging into that. Um, and it could be that for the, for the most part, gold is more profitable, but there's one client that's really annoying. And so they need to be moved down to silver. 
because they're always demanding on-site service or something like that. The agreement subtype, again, I mentioned is a different type. It's not a subtype of the first type. It's a separate type itself. Uh, managed, unmanaged, device only. It's, it gives you essentially like two-dimensional categorization of the contract itself. All right. Status, for the most part, will do live. This is used primarily for managing the agreement itself as if it's like a paper agreement. Is it is it a draft? Is it confirmed? Is it live, expired, void, and so on and so forth? So we'll set this to live. And then again, I say this all the time, show and lists, this checkbox is not a show and lists checkbox. It is a active or inactive checkbox. So yeah, uh, for the most part, if something needs to be active, you need to make sure it's showing in lists. And if you need to hide it from somewhere, there's likely going to be another way, another way to hide it. For the most part, everything that's being used should always be active. And if you need to hide it from certain places, there are ways that you can hide it from different places. Okay. In this case, we'll show in lists. And this is basically it. This is all we need to cover for the managed services contracts. There are a couple other things that we can dive into we're not going to talk about right now. We're going to go ahead and save this contract. And now we have our new Mendy Online Managed Services contract based off type. Um, all right, so that's basically it. We have the agreement. How do we use it? Um, we talked about um, the four different types of billing plans that Halo has. Uh, again, I'll cover, I'll, you know what, instead of talking about it, I'm just going to show you. Under, um, if we go to the Mendy Online customer, we can go to our billing tab, and there's something called the billing plan combinations. This is one of the magic things about Halo that I love. And it is the ability to define very specific criteria and apply a very specific billing plan based off the time entry being added for each time entry that you add. So it's not per ticket necessarily, it's literally per time entry. Some of the criteria that we talk about will be ticket level and some will be per time entry. So with that being said, let's just dive right in. If I go ahead and add a uh, rule here, it's going to show me two sections of the screen. I've got billing criteria and billing plan. Billing criteria is basically the conditions that will define what time is captured when I enter it in. So if I add, I set a sequence number of 10, that's where I start from. I don't care about site, ITIL type, or ticket type. Maybe I do care about ticket type, actually. I'm going to say for projects. Uh, for the most part, if you're an MSP, almost never. I think I've run into a couple who do it, but almost never is your project work actually included in your managed services contract. Projects are almost always billable as additional work on top of it. So managed services are we manage your systems, we support your systems, we help your users, we manage your vendors, and so on and so forth. You want something brand new to be installed, that's a cost. Uh, because we didn't account for it at the time of creating the contract. And so we need to, number one, spend the time to build, configure, find out how it works, implement it into your systems, integrate it to your systems. And then number two, we need to up your contract to cover for the new devices or systems that we just put in. So for the most part, projects will always be billable. So I'm going to choose any project ticket type. And in fact, I'm going to go one level up. I'm going to say any ITIL ticket type that's classed as projects. So this is one level higher than ticket type, and we'll talk about this when we get into ticketing. If you don't, if you're not following, um, it'll be significantly different. And then finally, we've got different charge rates we can filter through. So almost every field here that we see is ticket level. Uh, if I do a time entry and a ticket has these conditions, the only one that isn't is the charge rate. The charge rate is the only thing that's action specific. And so the action could be a remote support, ticket meeting certain criteria, then perform covered by contract, or the action be on-site support. Again, uh, ticket meeting certain criteria, and then go ahead and charge that ticket uh, because it's on-site support if we were talking about the remote-only contract. In this case, I don't need to change anything else in my criteria. I'm only doing projects for the ticket type, and then I'm going down to the billing plan, and I'm gonna say billing plan for projects is to pay as you go. Notice the four options that I have here. This is These are the four options I listed out before. I got contract, which means it's covered, I have don't invoice, which is I'm writing off that time. I don't care where it went. And then prepay, sorry, pay as you go, which means it's going to invoice it. And then I have prepay, which will actually account against the prepay collection pool uh, of hours or time, uh, sorry, of, of time or money um, under that client. So in this case, I'm going to say pay as you go. We're going to save that. Let's say that, you know, they give me for, uh, you know, service requests they give me a certain amount of time service requests are also changes being made to the system. They give me certain, uh, like small projects basically. So I'm gonna say they give me a certain amount of 
hours or, or dollar amounts to cover the service requests themselves. We're going to save that. And then for incidents, basically any kind of help desk, break, fix, repair issue, no matter what it is, I'm going to go ahead and cover that by the contract. And we're going to save this as well. All right. Um, notice that my sequencing went all out of order. So I want to go ahead and fix that really quickly. This will be 20. And so that no matter what, uh, projects will always be billable. And then this will be 30 because I keep forgetting to put sequence numbers in here. And so this is how it now looks. The rules do get evaluated in order. So if um, uh, rule 10 runs and it doesn't match, it will look at rule 20. And then if it doesn't match, it'll look at, it'll look at rule 30. Now it is not a check and then move on. Um, what I mean by that is if we run out of prepay hours, it's not going to fall back to the contract. There's, there's no fallback here. Uh, if I run out of contract hours, it's not going to fall back to prepay. It's only going to use one thing. Once that thing is used up, it will bill you. Uh, that is how the system works. So if we go ahead and finish this up, we have the ability to set the unmatched uh, action. So if it doesn't match to any of these rules, we can go ahead and hit pay as you go. And I'm going to go ahead and save this. So this is now my um, billing plan and work will be covered. Now notice if I go to prepay here, we didn't really talk about prepay too much. I'm just going to throw some hours in here just so we can see um, that it's going to be, it's just so we can see how it's going to get used up. And we'll just put the invoice date so that it's indicated that it's already been billed. And we will go ahead and save this. I'm running low on time for my next call, so this will be interesting in how far I get. The next thing I want to do is I just want to show you how this works. If I'm going to create an incident, we'll put it under the Mendy Online Client, and we'll say, This will be contract time. And we'll set a category. I don't need a contract set. So ideally, and again, we'll talk about this in ticketing, but this field should not exist. We don't want the contract being applied to the ticket because if you do that, it overrides the billing plan combination. So we don't want that contract field to exist. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and do a private note and I'm gonna throw some time in, in progress. We'll put in one hour and we'll set this to remote support. And I will save this. Right, and notice that the contract hours is now showing up right here. Right, so we've got contract hours specified as we would expect um, because time is going against the contract. If I go view edit the time, the action itself, and I go to time tracking tab, we can see that the contract ID went to nine. And as I mentioned before, the only thing that we see is the reference itself. So we can see it went to many line managed services. Just by knowing that, we can see it's the right contract. If I didn't have that, I didn't know the reference, I'd have to click on it to then open it up to find out what the heck happened. All right, with periodic history, we can see that we've got one hour of unit used um, into this period. We can click on here and we can see that we've got the one hour here. So we can see it properly went to the contract correctly. If I go ahead and build another ticket, and this time the ticket will be service request, and we're gonna go for building it on Mendy Online, and we'll say test prepay time, all right? Let's go ahead and submit this. And let's add a private note again. We'll do some more billable time. And we'll say another hour. And we'll say it's remote support. And we'll save this. What we should see is this becomes prepay hours. Now, prepay hours, for some reason, there's a bug. It disappears once it shows it. But if you right click, if you right click, go to view edit actions and go to time tracking, we will see that the prepay hours billing plan applied. And down here, prepay hours, we can see one hour was used. Finally, if you go back to the client, and go back to the prepay tab, um, we can see that it actually used one hour and there's 99 hours remaining. Okay, so that's basically how the billing plan combination works in very high level. The last one is the invoicing. I'm just gonna assume you trust me in the fact that it will bill because we have pay as you go. I'm just describing the idea of how the combination works and so you can see it in action. Let's get a little bit more complicated for a moment. Um, let's say you've got different types of contracts where different types of things are supported. So for example, um, let's dive back to our contract types. If we go to our configuration, go to contracts, we have the ability to specify in, the, in this screen, we can configure the contract types and the agreement subtypes, keeping in mind that these are just lookup codes. And so if I click into them, my breadcrumbs get all messed up, which is completely fine. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna rename some of these and I'm gonna say this gold package is unlimited enterprise. And we're going to go back and say that 
this is unlimited professional, right? Now, what is the difference between these? Um, it's up to you, right? It depends on what contracts you're offering and what services are covered by each one. But let's say, for example, that um, if we go to our categories and we start building out our categories here, let's say, for example, if we had anything related to security, we got IT security stuff, that would be enterprise. If we have anything related to like third party, I don't know if it's a thing here. Um, let's see. Nope, we do not have. So let's do this. Let's just build out third party applications. And then we can say something like uh, vendor liaison. Uh, if I spell that correctly, not, I don't want really to care and I'm in a rush. So I'm going to just keep going. Third party applications again. And then we can say something like, you know, um, uh, report building or user management or something like that, right? Anything that has to do with managing a different uh, application, like a line of business application, right? So we've got two third-party applications here that hopefully are both spelled the same way. Um, so what we want to do is let's go take a look at our, and we do have patching, right? No, no patching, RMM, maintenance, come on. Okay, let's just do this really quickly. Uh, and we'll say alert handling. And we'll do uh, RMM monitoring and we'll do patching, for example. Okay. So now let's go back to, let's, let's talk about billing templates at this point, right? So if we have billing templates, a so billing template, which is off by default, you have to come in here and turn it on. So it's off by default. Uh, it'll be off and you want to actually turn it on so that you can see it. A billing template will allow us to define a set of rules and, and settings for billing to apply to a customer in mass, essentially, and manage it globally uh, instead of per customer. So we can come in here and say like MSP billing plan, basically, and now let's start building out the specifics of what we just talked about, right? So sequence 10, again, we're gonna say projects. We know that already is billable, so we're gonna say pay as you go. And we're gonna go ahead and save that, this, and then we're gonna come in here and say, well, um, if, let's say this is now 20, uh, we're going to forget the rest of the rules that we had, and we're going to start building out the ones that we're just talking about. So we want to focus on category now. And we could say, well, if there's IT security uh, in the name, and everything here is IT security threats, we're just going to select it. I'm going to choose partial match so, that, match so that I can remove everything after it. And essentially, every single category under IT security threats, basically, is now going to follow this rule, which is going to say it's going to be covered by contract only if they have a contract type of unlimited enterprise. And then I'm going to go ahead and save this. And now I'm going to do that again. And this will be 21, um, which will do the exact same, the exact same setting, which will say it's pay as you go. All right. So now this rule will come into play. This rule will be ignored if it exists. And then we'll just keep going. The next one that we've got is 30, right? 30 is going to be covered, covering the specific one of third-party application. And again, we're going to cover this for both enterprise and professional. So we'll set the contract type to be enterprise and save this. And then we'll do the exact same rule again. Let me just grab this in my clipboard if I can. This will be 31. Oop, 31. And then category third party applications, partial match, please. And then we'll set this to contract. And this will be professional. We can save this. And then the finally, we'll do it one more time 32. 32 will be, again, partial match. Save, paste that. This will be pay as you go. All right now, everything else that we're going to do is going to be essentially. Um, incident, let's say incident is covered. And we don't even need to do the contract type for RMM now that I'm thinking about it and actually doing this. Um, but we can absolutely do, well, we can say contract type is managed if they have a managed contract type. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and do this. Let's say the ticket type is is all and they've got 
um, a contract type of RMM, unlimited RMM, and the category is RMM monitoring and patching. Okay. So this is for the ones who have like RMM only. This will be 40, right? Unlimited RMM, save that. Okay. So this will cover if they have unlimited RMM. And then everything else is going to be incident. Um, or we can even just say all. No, we would want to do. Yeah, we're going to say all. Okay, so everything at this point is covered. If they have a contract where the contract subtype is managed. Right? And so that way, save this. Uh, if their subtype is managed, everything gets covered. I don't know. Oh, it's on top. My bad. Let's set that to 50. All right. This logic is going to get a little confusing. Um, let's go ahead and save this. But this is what I mean by having like two step thing. Let's see if I can. I got nine minutes left. If I can show this off and how this is going to apply, it's going to be really cool if I get it just in time. Um, all right, so with this in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at this client that I have, right? So we've got the billing plan combinations. We've got our billing template created. We want to apply the billing template to the billing for this client. Um, the thing that we want to keep in mind about is that, number one, in here, we've got two drop downs. We do not want to set the default contract for new tickets. I cannot stress this enough. I say it all the time, and then everyone always forgets it because it's very, very, very annoying how it's right there. Bottom line is, if you were to set a contract here, it will override the billing plan combination. This needs to be written in red or something. It will override the billing plan combination, and it's not something that you want to do. Um, so leave this as blank all the time, or NA, and it should not be used. The billing template is what will be used, and what we'll see happen is it's going to update our billing plan combination to follow the, pa the path of the plan according to whether or not the contract type exists properly, right? And so I've got IT security um, threats going towards managed services, pay as you go, going towards managed services. I don't know what type of contract that was. Let's just refresh this for a moment and quickly look at this really fast. So if we go look at our contract, our contract type is unlimited enterprise. There we go, that makes sense. All right, so if I go to billing and apply this billing plan, we'll see the enterprise rule take effect because everything is covered by enterprise essentially. So if we come here and apply it, we'll see that projects get billed, IT security is covered. This one gets ignored because this is covered. Third-party applications is covered by the enterprise contract. This gets ignored and everything else is covered by the enterprise contract. Right, it's that simple. What happens now if I go change the type of agreement? So let's say we go back to the agreement or the contracts tab and we go into our contract and so you know what, this is really not an enterprise. We're gonna say it's unlimited RMM and the agreement subtype is really just unmanaged or device only, let's say. Let's save that, okay? So now if we come back here and go back to our billing tab and then just reapply the billing template, I don't, I'm not even, notice I'm not saving changes. The billing template will apply to the client. It will not save the changes. It will just load the logic and apply the template. Notice right here, we've got uh, projects are billable, IT security threats are billable, third-party applications are billable, RMM notifications, are, RMM category is covered by the RMM only contract and everything else is billable, right? So using this two-step logic, we can really build out super complicated billing mechanisms to allow for proper billing so that your managers that are doing review of tickets to say this ticket is, should be billable, this ticket should not be billable. The goal that we want to get to is that when a technician goes and creates a ticket, and that ticket category is patching, they're not thinking about the contract. They're thinking, what am I doing here? Am I adding a user? I'm changing a user. I'm just selecting, you know, uh, security, I don't know, email spoofing, right? Like, I'm, I, the technician doesn't worry about the top level. They're searching for the category of what the ticket is. That category gets aligned to a billing plan based off your agreement type, and that will automatically cover the work or not cover the work based off things that you need. If you don't need all this stuff and you're super simple, then that's great. Um, I'm not here to tell you you should make it more complicated. I'm just here to say that if it is already complicated, then you can support, Halo can support the needs that you have for you. Um, and this is just getting an understanding of how this works. I'm going to show you one more time. If I go back to our 
billing or agreement, I mean, and change the agreement type to be instead of RMM only and device, let's say it's unlimited RMM managed and it's unlimited professional instead of enterprise. And so now I'll just save this and we can go back to here and just reapply the template again and we'll see the new rules uh, take effect. We're now IT security, we're paying for third party applications of being covered. This rule gets skipped. And the next one is we cover all help desk stuff, basically. Um, and that's it. That's all I got for you in terms of uh, this stuff. I think that's everything I was supposed to talk about. Um, I got contract types done, contracts, billing plan combinations, and billing templates. And I got it all done within the time frame required for my next phone call. Hopefully this was helpful for you. And any tangents that I made uh, are not my fault. I blame my mind. If you have any questions, comments, feedback below, please leave them. And hopefully I get back on a more normal track of uploading additional videos. Thank you for watching.